What's happening, guys? Today we are discussing a topic near and dear to my heart. We are talking about beaters. And I'm going to give you a little guide of how I follow my path around with beater life. Uh, I'm going to show you what to look for when you're buying these old cars, uh, who to buy from, uh, recommendations on some of the vehicles that I think make good beaters, and why I think you should own one. So, stick. So I think we should start out by defining what a beater is. And that definition has sort of changed over the years. And as the economy has sort of, you know, inflation, what have you, I think that under $1,500 is still probably considered a beater, but really to be in the game, got to be under a thousand to be a real contender. Uh, this vehicle right here, I paid just $750 for yesterday. I haven't done a thing to it yet, but it is definitely in the definition of beater. It's got rust. It's got dings. It's got dents. It's got ratty seats. It's got over 200,000 miles. However, it still runs and drives excellent and will make great transportation for at least the winter and maybe then some. Maybe I can part it out when I'm done with it. Maybe I can sell it. Or in the, you know, illustrious words of Easy e throw it in the gutter and go buy another. So when buying a beater, it is essentially all, all, all function over form. You cannot be looking at the aesthetic, you know, appeal of a vehicle when you're buying a beater. It doesn't matter if it has rust, if it's dented up, if it's dinged up. If it's got massive dents in it, if the panels are four different colors, it does not matter because you don't care what the man thinks of you. You just want to get to work or whatever it is that you're doing. But I will stress on the rust situation, if you're up in the north, check your structural integrity. Look at the frames really, really well. If it's a unibody, got to make sure that the strut isn't ready to bust through the bottom of the thing because that's a bummer when that happens. And it can, and it does. So pay attention to that in the rust factor. But other than that, it doesn't matter. Just got to get something that runs good. So I've got this beautiful Tahoe pulled into the garage now. I've been piddling with it a little bit. But my next recommendation is going to be buy a beater at your skill level. You do not want to be batting in the major leagues when you're not even playing t-ball yet. So uh, if it needs brakes, if that's something you can do, go ahead and buy it. If it needs a rear end, if it needs struts, if it needs CV axles, you got to buy within your comfort level at that time. Don't go out, jump in the deep end, not have any idea how to do it. And that brings me to my next point, that if you're buying a car with a blown up motor or a slipping transmission or something, some major, 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 that is not a beater. That is a project car, which is an entirely different branch of the driving bad car family tree. So keep that in mind. And I would also like to point out, I did not buy these brakes. These brakes came with the, the vehicle. And that is something you often find when buying these, these vehicles is it comes with parts. You know, maybe somebody thought that they could do a little more than they could have. Maybe they got lazy on the project, what have you. But always ask if there's free parts, if there's parts that come with it, what have you. Because this thing needed brakes. It came with it. It needed a tie rod. I got that with a different project vehicle I bought a few weeks back. It came with a big box of front end parts and it didn't happen to need that that particular tie rod, so I, I had one on hand. And that goes into another facet of this whole thing is buying bunches. Buy a few of them, buy three, four, five of the same vehicle, and you'll always have something that'll run or have parts that you need, what have you. Uh, it makes for a better experience with these vehicles is having several of them, and maybe you can get one that runs correctly all the time. It's a fascinating thing. I would also like to take a moment to point out the importance of buying a car with good tires on it. And if not, that's a great um, strategy for getting a few bucks off the thing because tires, let's face it, are expensive. And if you bought a brand new set of tires, you may have doubled the value of the vehicle or or it may not even be worth what the tires you have on it are. So it might be a little bit more important in the north, but still uh, buying a car with good tires on it is always a good deal. And it, it, it's a major savings if you can. So something to consider when buying these things as well. And now we're going to talk about probably the most important part of buying one of these cars. And that is the test drive. Now, when you're walking up to this car, you know, you, you've just gotten to the neighborhood, whatever it might be, and it's already running. That's a bad sign. I don't like to buy cars that are already running when I'm walking up to it. How long did that thing take to start? Did it take 40 cranks? Did it? Did it clatter like a, like a, you know, cart falling down the flight of stairs when it started up? You don't know. You always want to walk up to an ice cold vehicle. Put your hand right on top of it. 
see if it's warm because they might have had it running before you got there as well. That's a that's a lovely tactic as well that I've run into a few times. So always get into a cold car. You don't want it warmed up. And if you, and if you tell them, hey, I'll come back in a few hours, let it let it sit. That's fine too, because you, you might take a little bit of gambling out of that. Ah. So you're going to hop into your chariot and hear all the door pins squeak and rattle and all that stuff. And that's all fine. As long as the driver's door opens, you're way ahead of the game. The other doors may not matter as much depending on the size of your family or what you need. But having that driver door that works, always essential. So you're going to get in, start it up, see what it does. Perfect. Start it right up. No problems. And so what's the first thing you noticed when this uh, truck started up is it was loud, you know, exhaust is loud. And maybe that's something that matters to you. Maybe it's something that doesn't. That kind of depends on where you live potentially. Like do you live in a suburb or in a city where you might get hassled for something like that or annoy your neighbors or maybe it just annoys you. You have to decide if that's an exhaust problem you can fix, you want to fix, all that. And where it's located in the vehicle. If it's back from the Y pipe, you're probably in pretty good luck. Uh, that's cheap. That's easy. You can fix it or an exhaust shop can fix it for dirt, dirt cheap. However, if it's a manifold leak, I tend to step away because those can be a complete pain. Rusted manifold bolts, busted manifold bolts, terrible. And it sounds the worst too. The back leaks you can get away with. It sounds like, oh, it's throaty V8, blah, blah, blah. The rest of it up there, yuck, no fun. No good. And on that test drive, after you got the car running, driving, you know, started right up, what have you, you're going to want to get it going 60, 65 miles an hour, you know, highway speeds and see what shakes, what rattles, uh, what kind of vibrations you got. There's going to be something. And, and you're going to want to assess that, you know, how, what, what level of chicanery am I dealing with here? And if it's not too bad, if it's, if it's something you can live with, you get back, great. The next thing you want to do is just look under the car after you've gotten it fully op operate, operating temp. Is it leaking coolant? Is it leaking oil? Is it leaking radiator or uh, transmission fluid? Any of the big three. Go from there. Power steering also. I would check that because that can be a major pain. And then you're going to want to go over this thing. Wetness is okay. Dampness is okay. But puddles are a no-go for me. I do not buy a vehicle with a puddle unless I've got a trailer, of course. That's a whole different story. That's buying a project. You're going to want to pull out your dipsticks, have a good look at them, smell them, make sure they're good. And always be wary of things like, oh, I just changed the fluid in this. I just changed the fluid in that. Sometimes that can be a ruse to, you know, hide a transmission that had dirty burnt fluid in it or, or oil that maybe has a milkshake going on or a slow milkshake. So that's why I always recommend getting these things up to operating temp before, before purchasing. You're going to want to you know, pull your transmission dipstick out, give it a real deep smell, look at it. Should be sweet smelling with, you know, it can be a little dirty or varnished, but if it smells burnt, it is burnt and something is not good. Now I'm going to give you my personal list of vehicles to avoid and ones that I think are on the good list. Now, right off the bat, I'm sorry, Europe, but anything made by Deutschland, Germany, um, British cars, Jaguars, what have you, Mercedes, all that stuff, it's out. Doesn't make good beater in most cases, unless it's real old, like a old diesel Mercedes or something. But anything else on that list, out. Way too complicated. Parts are way too expensive. Uh, nobody knows how to work on them, and they're just too complicated to make a excellent beater. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with those. It's like buying a luxury car for a beater as well. I also don't recommend that very highly because there's so many electronics, sensors, bells, whistles that just fail and just create more problems that you don't need in your, your beater lifestyle. You want simplicity. And with that being said, I think like as far as time frames to buy vehicles, that the late 90s is probably the best bunch of cars you can get into. It typically has onboard computer like OBD2 stuff, um, but has a simplicity of the older days to be able to work on it with great, great ease. Like the brakes on this thing took a half hour. They were just so simple, single piston, everything clicked in place. Great, easy, fun. 
Chevys of that era are excellent choices in general. Um, you know, you got the the v, the Vortec 5.7 stuff, really bulletproof. Uh, it, I would go a little bit earlier with the Fords as far as like pre-97 stuff when they went to that jelly bean design that everything breaks, it rusts hard and it's hard to work on. Go OBS stuff on that. I'd get any Japanese car, any Honda, any any uh, Toyota, any Nissan, not any Kia though, or any Hyundai. Those are junky brands. But the main, the main several of, uh, of the Japanese brands all make great vehicles. Cars, SUVs, trucks, doesn't matter. All really solid, all really reliable. And as far as type of car going between trucks and SUVs, I would always go for the SUV variant of that. I find that they tend to be a little bit less abused in their, their uses. Uh, they, they aren't used for hauling gravel or wood or stuff. It's usually just hauling people around, and it's a lot easier on them. And I find that that makes a big difference when buying these things. I would also tend to avoid most Chrysler products. I find that they just don't hold up as well as their, their same age counterparts. You know, the trucks have transmission issues. Um, the cars are just not that well designed. Uh, they're, they're kind of throwaway cars. Same goes with like Jeeps in there too. I mean, you can get older Jeeps and they make great vehicles, but the newer ones are just tangy, plasticky junk. And I, I'm, I'm, I've never been impressed with Chrysler products. I've never had good luck with them. So unfortunately I kind of got to throw them under the bus for this one. Buicks also make a great candidate for beater cars. They come with that 3.8 Buick motor that's been tried and tested and true forever. Make sure it's got that motor in it. If you're going to be buying an old beater. Those are good up to 300,000 miles, maybe more. They are bulletproof. It doesn't matter if you look like an old grandma in one or whatever. They last forever. They make good cars. Same goes for the Chevy family with those same motors. There's a lot of those. The Pontiacs uh, had a lot of those motors in them. The Grand Dams, the, the Grand Prix, I think, may have had them. I'm not sure. They might have the smaller one, but those make for good beaters too. But at the end of the day, it's all about how these vehicles were taken care of. I mean, mileage also may not matter because maybe it's got 215,000 miles on it, but it's been taken care of and driven pretty regularly. Or maybe it's got 75,000 miles on it. It's been sitting in a driveway or under a tree for most of its life. That doesn't necessarily make a good car just because it's got low miles on it. It may have every gasket on it dried up, cracking and ready to, and just the rust coming up from under it may be a bit intense. So it's all, it all comes down to how they were taken care of at a certain point. So Always take that in mind and take my opinions on cars with a grain of salt, obviously, because there's good and bad in every bunch. That, that much is for certain. And here's another thing I would avoid. Not necessarily like the plague, but I would certainly think long and hard about before buying a beater plow truck. I mean, you can have a beater plow truck and it can be your plow and all that stuff. But if you're looking for like semi-reliable transportation, I would not put my faith in a plow truck. Uh, they're used pretty hard. Transmissions seem to always be, you know, broken or slipping. And it's just a lot of wear and tear to have on a vehicle. All that weight on the front of these cars, it's no good. So consider that when, when looking at a car or truck, SUV, whatever. Does it have a plow on it? Did it have a plow on it? Um, I wouldn't tend to trust it as much as I would something that never did. So consider that. Now let's talk about who you should buy these beaters from and who to avoid. Now, I'm going to start out the list by saying teenagers. Now, what does, that, what does that do to your brain when you hear that word? Does it make you think of bad choices and not taking care of stuff well and doing stuff not the right way? Because that's all that my mind goes to. If you buy a car from a teenager, there will be a stereo that's wired wrong. There will be, every bolt will be stripped out that they've touched. Uh, they don't know how to take care of anything and they don't have the money to take care of it. So they simply do not. Uh, so I would avoid buying from teenagers. That's a high rule in my book, and I always tend to stick by that one. Unless it's a really good deal, you know, maybe. But in my, in my travelings, that's what I found. Another I would avoid would be dealerships. In general, you're not going to get a good beater at a dealership. There's no guarantees. There's no nothing. If you buy a beater at even, you know, like a Chevrolet dealership or a standalone place that is independent or whatever, it doesn't matter there's no guarantees on that stuff either and you're always going to be paying way more for it than it's actually worth you know they, they gave somebody 250 bucks or 500 bucks for it they paid the beater price for it but then they're going to sell it to you for like decent used car price and it's not 
you typically in general don't want to be buying a beater from anybody that's looking to make a buck on the thing. They want to be washing their hands of it. They're done with it. You want, and, and, or on the other hand, you want to be looking for somebody that's desperate. They desperately need to get rid of the car. They desperately need $500, whatever it is. They're a decent candidate, the desperate, but the desperate have some qualms about them. While you can get a good deal on a car, it may not be in the condition that you were hoping for, perhaps. The desperate tend to smoke, have bad habits, and have filthy vehicles, and don't take care of stuff as well when it breaks. That When it's a problem, they have to fix it, but until it is, it's not fixed. So the desperate are like my second choice for buying used cars from, and I've done it plenty. Um, there's, there's lots of them around, so that's what you tend to get. The best person to buy a used vehicle from is a rich person. And I'm just going to say it just how it is. It'll be a third vehicle of them. It'll be the, the car that their kids grew up driving in. It'll be an extra car they've got or one that they kept at their vacation property. Something like that. The rich take excellent care of their vehicles. When something breaks, it's fixed. They're clean on the inside. They don't tend to smoke. All of these lead you to the best quality beater that you can hope to have. And while they are rare, they do occasionally occur. And those are the ones I keep my eye out for. You, you go up to the house and, or trailer in some cases, <laughs> and you know a little bit about that person before you even open that car door, what, what you're expecting when you get inside of it. And it tends to typically be true. So uh, pay attention to the neighborhood when you, when you pull up to the place. Is it a nice house with, an, with a pool and whatever else? You might be getting a good deal on that car, and they just want to get rid of it. And that's, what I, and that's who I look for to buy from when I'm, when I'm going back and forth with these cars and trying to get a good deal and find one that suits me well. Now we're going to talk about why you should buy a beater. And there are a plethora of reasons. One, cheap. It's cheap, cheap, cheap. You can buy you know, a car every other month, I think, roughly, for what people pay in car payments these days. You know, If you're paying $750 bucks for a car, think about that. That's awfully cheap. And say when you're done with it, say it blows up on you tomorrow, you can still get two, three, four hundred bucks from the scrap man for it. You're not going to be out a lot of money. It's just a fun way to live. I mean, and that's the other thing about it. It's fun. It's gambling almost. It's one of the few pleasures a man can have in this world with very little downside. I mean, will you always get to work on time? You don't know. That's part of the fun. I mean, it's always a game of roulette, basically, with these beaters. Will it start? Will the engine blow up today? Will, you know, a brake just seize up on the highway and leave you stranded? You don't know, but it's a lot of fun to do it. The other thing is, and I'm not a hippie or anything, but it's incredibly environmentally friendly. The best vehicle you can buy and drive is a used vehicle. Its entire carbon footprint is gone. It has long since washed away. The building of a vehicle is the largest print it will ever make. And beyond that, it's, it, it is basically recuperated throughout its lifetime. So if you think buying a Tesla or a Prius or something new with high gas mileage is the way to go, it's not. Mining that, moving that, all that, manufacturing that, it all goes into its carbon footprint, which is a heck of a lot higher than like a 98 Tahoe that gets 17, 18 miles to the gallon. So, I mean, not that I totally care about that, but it is something to consider when you're trying to be an environmentalist. If you're, if you're going to be a good person, go buy the 1990 Corolla with 250,000 miles on it. It has, no, it has only life to give and not carbon to put back in. So that's something to consider as well. Buying a beater is also like getting a hobby for almost free. If you want to get your hands a little dirty, if you want to kind of learn to work on a car, the best way to do it is to drive a beater. You will learn a lot every day. When you're Googling, you know, why does the radio whistle when I'm driving down the road or why does this shimmy or this shake, what have you, you're going to learn a lot along the way. And you're going to have some fun doing it if you, take the, if you have the right mentality about it. It's, uh, it's a great learning tool. You know, you might not necessarily always have to be at the, the beholden of like a mechanic or something. You might know a little bit more to sound at least dangerous when you go to these places. And that's always fun because uh, 
that's that's most of the reason why I got into wrenching on cars and stuff is I always felt like I was getting taken advantage of by somebody. And when you learn little tricks of the trade, you're not as likely to have that happen to you. And y you can just go a little further with your mechanical knowledge. And I've always found that very enjoyable about driving these old cars is kind of learning about them. Look at that. Window even works. Well, I hope I've given you some good information here to get today, guys. Uh, always remember, ask a lot of questions. You'll learn a lot. And uh, good luck buying your beater. You guys have a good day.